Tov Chavrim, and it is, ah, uh, I've changed, chased my glasses. All kinds of technical difficulties here today on Shabbat. Uh, the internet, I, my computer didn't want to get on the internet. Tried to use a phone, that didn't work, and well, it just led to a whole lot of issues, and uh, I wanted to speak to you just a few minutes here uh, to kind of update you of things that are going on. I know Brother Al Lamont, when he finds out about the video that I'll be doing tomorrow, by God's grace, I'm sure he will be excited as well. And uh, because the Lord has just really been unraveling, and, I, and, and I'm, at, I'm at this very moment, I'm actually looking for some things to share with you about Edom. And... Um, I've got notes galore, and uh, I have studied passage after passage, the Lord's mercy just to reveal, um, uh, basically take you down through Adam to prove to you who Adam is. Uh, my precious sister, uh, Lori Cardoza Moore, was here with me, and I have not released the video there with her and Brother Gary Scoggibo. Uh, Laura, you might know her from Fox News. She's been on there a number of times. She's with Proclaiming Justice to the Nations. Uh, very, very staunch advocate for Israel and fighting anti-Semitism. And she kind of picked up the Edom uh, issue a little bit, but she's taking it more down the, um, you might say, the lane of the Reformation, dealing with the Protestants that uh, stood by while Israel was being slaughtered in the Holocaust and the Christian pulpits, churches were silent. And, and, and so I do applaud that. Uh, but uh, she hasn't been able to quite see the dots connected to the Vatican as of yet. So she's kind of withheld uh, speaking much on that. But I just thank God that she's taken the stand to recognize that, that the Edomites of today is a religious spirit. But uh, this video that I intend to be doing here is going to lay out without a doubt who Adam is. I'll be bringing this out tomorrow. Uh, I know you're probably saying, oh gosh, brother, I thought it was going to be tonight. Nope. I, there's too much here. There's too much information that I'm going to share with you. And I don't want it just to be tossed about. There, there, there's actually, um, I'm looking for a particular scripture right now. It's something I was going to use this morning that uh, I wanted to share with you. And I've got so many pages of note on on Adam, uh, and uh, but it, there was a, there was one in particular this morning that I came across that just really touched my own heart. Um, and oh gosh, here I am getting the, just to kind of give you a little taste about Adam, and uh, let's see if I can find that real quick for you here. Um, Oh, yes, here it is. I believe it's in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 20. So let's take a quick take a quick run there. I want to share with you. Uh, let me just say this as well. It's not just the study. It's the revelation that God is giving me on all, all this information. Overwhelming, overwhelming to say the least. But I want to put it in order for you so that you can understand it and it makes sense plausibly, logically, Let's deal with some of the historical facts to prove it, etc. So it may not come out till tomorrow night, but uh, let me give you a little taste of it here. Let's take real quick, let's go into 2 Kings chapter 3, starting with verse 11. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king, um, one of the, excuse me, where I can see this, right? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. you got to keep in mind, it's, it's interesting enough, three kings have come together. They're going down, they're, they're, they're wanting to deal with the uh, Moabites, if, I'm, if I remember right in the story here. And they've joined forces together as the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom. Uh-huh. Kind of ironic that it's a threesome here. So anyway, uh, Jehoshaphat, the only one that's a decent man of the bunch there, uh, 
wants to consult the prophet to find out whether or not this is of God or not that they're doing because they're on a journey headed down there. I think it takes seven days to get to where the battle's going to be fought at and uh, with all their men, their, their, the cattle that they have to feed the men and stuff. And uh, suddenly they're, they're, they're thirsting to death because there's no water. And so Jehoshaphat said, to the, uh, said uh, to, uh, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to, to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called thee three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. Now that is powerful in itself. If it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, see, he's the king of the house of Judah. And the house of Judah is who's in Israel today. So it might be said if the prophet Elisha was here today, if it wasn't for Benjamin Netanyahu, I would not even regard the Pope of Rome or anyone else for that matter, Bill Clinton or Barack Obama or all the rest of them. He wouldn't even regard them if it wasn't for the sake of the Prime Minister Netanyahu. So anyway, Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not, okay, we already read that there. Verse 15, but now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass uh, when the minstrel uh, played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, You shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall, you, uh, shall be filled with water, and you may drink both you and your cattle and your beast. Interesting. It's not going to be by rain. It's not going to be by wind. Supernaturally, God will cause water to come to these ditches. And here these men are dying, and dying of thirst, you know, practically at their deathbed because of no water after seven days there. Their supplies probably ran out after three. They're in a very serious situation. Hmm. Watch what he says next, though. Verse 18, And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand, and he shall smite every fenced city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree and stop all the wells of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. Now you might say, Brother Steve, I don't get that. But you have to remember, Edom is Rome. And who was it that offered up, in this case here, the morning sacrifice? Who was hung on the cross one morning 2,000 years ago? who became, in this case, the sin offering, it was Yeshua. And it was Edom, it was Rome, that actually offered him up. And what was it that the Roman soldier did? He took a spear and drove it in the side of Yeshua after his life had left him, and water came out separated from the blood. The reason why the troughs were filled with water was because as a type of, during the wilderness journey, God had Moses and the elders of Israel to strike the rock that it bring forth its waters. And it also fed a dry and thirsty land, a land of people that had need. Both the cattle and the men all drank. And here again, God is showing us, foreshowing us here in the book of Kings, that it will come by the way of Adam. In other words, it would be the Edomites that would cause this water to come forth in the future, which would be none other than Rome. Let me just share another scripture with you real quick before I let you go and we come back to this again tomorrow. And that is, um, ugh, 
I hope I did not lose it because, uh, yes, an Obadiah. Just so I don't leave you hanging because I realize there's people that may come and, and, and read or listen to this video that it would be the first time for them and they'd have no idea. So let's turn then to Obadiah again. And uh, like I said, some of the reasons for this is because I want to um, establish for you exactly who Adam is. Now, this is only a taste, just a taste of what we're going to go into. I want to take you from all the way from the time that Esau, uh, well, we're just going to skim over the fact that Esau and Jacob, they were born, they were at each other, they were fighting in the womb and etc. But let's look at Obadiah. There's only one chapter. We're going to go to verse 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Thy brother Jacob, well, he's speaking of Esau, naturally. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that, thou, that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates. Maybe we should back up just a little bit more. I want you to catch this right. Let's go to verse 6. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Isn't that interesting? God's wanting you to search out. How are the things of Esau searched out? See, Esau is not just one little man that lived way back, gosh knows what, who even knows how long ago that was now. Uh, thousands of years ago, though. Um, there's a lot deeper to this story. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding. There's no, no understanding in him. Eat bread with thee. No wonder why they have a communion kosher bread. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the mount of Esau? So, now remember, when we did the video with John Costick, John brings out, they call Rome Edom back 2,000 years ago because they were afraid of being persecuted or tortured or imprisoned for speaking against Rome. It was a capital offense. You could be put on a cross and, and killed for speaking against Rome. So instead of calling Rome by their name Rome, they called them Edom. Now, that's just historical documentation. What we're dealing with is biblical documentation where God is going to identify Adam by Scripture. So, shall I not at that in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Adam and understanding out of Mount Esau? And thy mighty men of Teman shall be dismayed to the end, and every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners, entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. Now, notice what he's doing here. He's identifying Rome by the actions that happens to Israel. And here we see Israel, there's being lots cast for. She's being taken away, captive. It's dealing with Jerusalem, which is the house of Judah. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother and the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. He now identifies Judah. You see, it's not just Jacob, it's Judah, the house of Judah, and their destruction. That's 70 AD. Now God is identifying Esau, or Edom here, he, he gives them both names, both Edom and Esau. Both names are used for him here. And God clearly identifies it 
as the ones that were there when the house of Judah was destroyed. And that was under the Roman general Titus under his command, was it not? Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. That's verse 13. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. The Ark of Titus. Plainly. Plainly for everybody to see the Ark of Titus. Showing the treasures of the temple going back to Rome that are still in the Vatican catacombs to this day. So you wonder who... Esau is now, who Adam is. It should, should be no question. Then he goes into verse 14. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of, of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of, of his that did, re, that did remain in the day of distress. Rome goes down there to, uh, to Masada and camps about there. They, they had escaped the slaughter in Jerusalem. But no, you, you have to hunt down every Jew you possibly can and kill all of them. Hmm. For the day of the Lord is near upon the heathen, or the nations, that is. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain. He's not talking about 2,000 years ago. See, you've got to remember, he's putting this also in the future. The day of the vengeance of the Lord is upon them. That does apply to 2,000 years ago too. It's got a compound meaning, no doubt, because Titus did drink in the, the, um, he did drink in the temple. But notice what he says here. My holy mountain. Let's see how he describes it though. So shall all the heathen drink, or all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. If he's got to do a deliverance on Mount Zion, then the holy mountain is Mount Zion. That happens to be the tomb of David. You may not have realized that, but that's what that is. That's where the tomb of David is on Mount Zion. The temple is on Mount Moriah, which is also God's holy mountain too. But he identifies deliverance on Mount Zion. Why does he identify Mount Zion separately from Mount Moriah? Because God knows there's not a temple there. Interesting, isn't it? There shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. So Rome, your end, is nigh at hand. Um, you, you, you're just, you're just going to become nothing. Let me share one other one with you here, and then, then I'll let you go for tonight, and uh, I'll come back and go into this a little bit deeper with you. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 8. Um, let's look at verse 16. In the fifth year of Jerome, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being the king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat and King Judah, the king of Judah began to reign. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and reigned eighty-eight years in Jerusalem. Now keep in mind that the, the, these two boys here, they have different names, Jerome and uh, Jehoram. I know they sound alike, look alike. If you're not really paying attention, you get them mixed up and you think, gosh, they got this. Both, both guys have, they have the same dad, diff, two different dads and one guy, but no, it's two different men. Thirty and two years old was uh, he when he began to reign and reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel as he did in the house of Ahab. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now notice, it's the daughter of Ahab. Anytime you're dealing with daughters, biblically speaking, it always represents a future generation. And these these people, literally, their lives were lived out, showed the events that would happen in the future here. Um, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake. 
as he promised him to give him always a light uh, and to his children. In those days, Adam revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. Isn't that interesting? Um, you, I don't know if you catch that yourself, but to me it was fascinating to see that because Adam revolts. And what did we see in, in Rome in 300 AD? There was a revolt. They wanted out from under the hand of the Jewish believers. The Romans did. They didn't want to be part of the believing church that was made of Jews. And so they revolted against Judah. Those were the believing Jews of that day. And they, got, they set up their own king. They set up the papacy of Rome. I just thought that was a little kind of a neat insight there for you guys to look at. Anyway, we're going to go into all this. Uh, I, I just ask you to pray for me that God will help me to put this together in the right way um, and lay it out in a chronological uh, sequence so you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. And I trust that it will be a blessing for you. Anyway, God bless you. We love you. Uh, thank you for supporting this ministry. Baruch Hashem. Pray for Israel. Our people need it more than you could ever imagine. I hope you enjoyed also Sister Leora Beth Halavi uh, that spoke up in Indiana there. What a precious sister. I always like to kid her. I said, uh, you know, we are cousins, sister. You know, we are both from a Levitical tribe as well. So God bless her. I love this sister very much. And I uh, thank God for her and for her ministry. And uh, it was a pleasure for me and my wife to get to, well, we actually met her up in uh, Chicago. This, she was the host of the, of the convention up in Chicago. And so we wanted you to get a little chance to see uh, how she speaks. What a passion she has for the Lord. And I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for her, well, let me just put it this way here. That sister knows how to try to get people into the spirit of worship. That's something me and my wife both really enjoyed about, about her. God bless you, Sister Leora. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem to all of our brothers and sisters as well. Shalom and Laila Tov.